Good morning, Kahal Kadosh, Shavu Atom, Memorach. Merochim Abba'im to everybody in this very special day of Yom Yerushalayim, the 28th day of Iyar, corresponding to the 29th of May. Today, also the 43rd day of Sefirat Omer, And today is also the Yorzeit of Shemuel Hanavi, the famous Shemuel, the son of Hannah, the one who anointed uh, David Melech eventually to become the king after the kingdom was removed from Shaul HaMelech. So we'll discuss uh, first uh, Yom Yerushalayim very briefly as we had the beautiful prayers today and based on our tradition we say Yehishem is expressing a token of gratitude for the miracle that occurred over 55 years ago on the 67 war, 1967, and the conquering of Yerushalayim and especially the area of the Arabite and the Kotel and that mega miracle that history uh, witnessed. Some of us may have been born and some of you may even have had a honeymoon to uh -huh. Israel, right? Somebody got married and planned the honeymoon to go to Eres Israel, 1967. What a beautiful plan. But then the war broke out and those plans had to be put in the back burner. But obviously, we have a lot of Pesukim and several, several, several times the word Yerushalayim is mentioned throughout the entire Tanakh. And that's why we say, Yehi Shalom Echelech Shalva Ve'armenotaich. These verses come from the book of the Hilim, from the Shira Ma'alot, when David Melech talks about the building of the Beit HaMikdash. So he writes on that Be'ezat Hashem, uh, very, very soon, Yerushalayim will truly become yeah. Ayr Shel Shalom. Yeah. This Yerushalayim will become a true city of peace. Yeah. Although uh, there is a certain level of peace, but regretfully we cannot say that we have a 100% peace, especially when occasionally we hear of unfortunate uh, attacks uh, around the Kotel in Ayr Atika and any area of Yerushalayim of Eres Israel, but Be'ezat Hashem, uh, we hope and pray that this will change for the good with the Geula Sherema. Amen. 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 Next topic of today will be Shemuel Hanavi. Shemuel Hanavi really does not need my introduction. We know in the day of Rosh Hashanah, we read the Aftara, the Aftara from the book of Shemuel about the prayer that his mother Hannah prayed to have a child. And this prayer is so powerful that our hachamim, especially in the Sephardic tradition, establish her prayer as the opening statement of Shaharit. If you look at any Sephardic Sidur, after the Sota Shahar, Adon Olam, Tikkun Hasot, and Patah Eliyahu, what are you going to see? You're going to see Batit Palel Hanah. This is the prayer composed by the mother of Shemuel Hanavi. And we find a lot of powerful messages. Besides the, the gratitude to Hashem for having children, he, she teaches us many messages of Emunah in life. And the Hanav prayer says as follows. I'll bring you one or two of Pesukim. Hashem memitum hayye. God is the one who takes away life and gives life. Interesting that the order has been reversed. First the Pasuk speaks about death, and then the Pasuk speaks about life. This refers to the Hayat Metim, resurrection. Hashem morit she'ol bayad, a person, and has many different meanings of this verse. Morit she'ol, in English can be translated, the body is lowered to the grave, but then is get lifted up. Other explanation means that many times the person can hit a rock bottom and then Hashem helps the person to bounce back. Hashem morish uma ashir. God causes poverty and God causes wealth. That's a pasuk. Mashpil af meromen. The same way that Hashem lowers the person, Hashem also lifts the person. Mekin me afar dal. He raises the poor from the dust. Me'ashpot 
ירים אביון. אני זה אבל to uplift the pauper that's lower than אני. אני is a certain level of poverty. אביון is even lower. And therefore it says, להושיבים נדיבים, the guy or the person rather can be collecting food from a trash can. God forbid. And then suddenly what happens? להושיב עם נדיבים. Suddenly this person has a change in the life, the wheel of fortune changes, and now the person gets a front seat next to the, to the Nedivim, to the generous people, etc. Additionally, besides this being a, a prayer of a gratitude, perhaps it's imperative, or important I should say, that we discuss a bit the background of this prayer. Why this prayer is so powerful? I believe that the Benish Hai writes that one of the reasons why our rabbis establish this prayer every day, not only in Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the haftarah of Rosh Hashanah, but it's actually the opening of the prayer. The Benish Hai writes that the recitation of this prayer breaks down the barriers that can block the person stephilot. Sometimes there is a, a negative forces that block our prayers. There is such a thing, it's called hitzoni. Negative forces of darkness, spiritually speaking, block the prayers of the person. When we say this tefillah says the Benish Hai, we are breaking down the barrier. So let's spend a few moments to learn perhaps about Elkanah and about Shemuel, because at the end of the day, if we have these three Sadiqim, Elkanah was married to Hannah, and Hannah begot Shemuel, it must be that Elkanah and Hannah were very, very special people. And why do I say this? Shemuel and Nabi, it wasn't just a prophet. Shemuel and Navi, if you look in the book of the Hilim, was comparable to Moshe and Aharon put together. Can you think for what I just said? Moshe and Aharon were together and they couldn't reach Shemuel and Navi. And Shemuel lived a very short life. 52 years only. And he left the world prematurely by his own request. He asked to be taken from the world. Stay tuned. I'm not sure. It's coming. Igil Sami of Sali and Nabi. Let's talk about pregnancy of Shemuel. Then we'll talk about the birth. And then we'll talk about his life. So thank God they have access to a lot of good sefarim. And they have one that discusses historical facts of Sadiqim, especially in the great uh, topic of the Nevi'im. So we already know that Elkanah had two wives. One was called Penina, and one was called Hannah. Penina had 10 children, Hannah, had zero child, no child. Hannah, the Gemara writes in Megillah that she was one of the seven Neviot of Am Israel. Also, the Midrash Rabbah writes that he, in the generation of Elkanah, there was no one greater than Elkanah in his generation. Now, what caused him to be considered the greatest Sadiq of his time? Tana Leve Yahu writes that one of the things that El Kana will do will be Mehazek people. He will do Kiruv. He will outreach. He will encourage people to get close to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Now, Elkanah, if you look in the book of Shemuel, I don't have it with me, 
but he calls them the men of Hashem, God's representative in the world. One more thing is mentioned about Elkanah. We know that the story of Shemuel, thank you, Hannah and Elkanah happened way before the Bet HaMikdash was built. Because if the kingdom of Shaul took place during the life of Shemuel, then Shaul was a king of Israel for two years. And then David was a king for Israel for 40 years. And then David passes away and the kingdom is given over to Shelomo, which by the way, Shelomo was 12 years old when he became the king of Israel. And then took him several years to build the Bet HaMikdash. So there was in their lifetime of Shemuel, a hundred years without the Bet HaMikdash. So then, but we had the Mishkan, correct? We have different locations of the Mishkan. One of the biggest one was Shiloh, okay? So people used to go to offer korbanot to the Mishkan. So we know that when a person travels, correct? There are many ways of how to travel. Let's say today you want to travel to Israel. Baruch Hashem, we are blessed that El Al, right? And American Airlines, I believe, have direct flights to Israel. But before the direct flight, how people went to Israel? You take a stopover in New York, New Jersey, or you go to Europe, and then you travel to Israel, etc. So it's written about El Kanat that every time that he needed to go to the Mishkan to offer a korban for the holidays, he will not take the same route twice. He will take different routes and he will make the point of traveling through town and villages and find out if people were going to the Mishkan. Imagine yourself, Elkanah comes to you and asks you, are you coming to the Mishkan for the holiday? No, I'm busy, my business, my, the cost of the trip. Elkanah will say, this is your problem, I'll pay you the trips. This is how Elkanah worked. Every holiday, he will have different people that he will sponsor them to travel with him to get hizuk, to get spiritual encouragement in the moment of the holidays, whatever they may be. Correct. Now, he actually was one of the ones who started to, you know, to innovate this particular uh, tradition. Now, according to Bereshit, the Agadot of Bereshit, the level of Hesed of El Kana was comparable to the Madrega of Abraham Avinu. Now, Abraham Avinu, what the Pasuk says, Et Hanefesh Asher Asu Beharan, the souls that they created in Haran. How do you create Neshamot? You can create a human body. How do you create a Neshama? Rashi says, Abraham mekarev et ha'anashim. Abraham became a shariach of Chabad. He did kiru, outreach. That's exactly what El Kana do. El Kana mimic Abraham Avino to go out of his way to save Neshamot. What do you think? It's easy to be a shariach somewhere in the middle of nowhere. You know, usually when we move to a city, what do we look for? Kosher food, mikveh, restaurants, synagogues, schools. When you go to Shelihot, what do you look for? Neshamot. I'm telling you this from family experience. My niece lives in Davis, California, six hours away by car from Los Angeles. Wow. That's like from here to Vermont. More or less. And New York, New York. only frozen chicken maybe is found in the, in the marketplace. They organize a minyan at home. Shabbat, your son also in Utah, right? With yeah. Rabbi Tzipo. Yeah. All my, these areas. Yeah. My classmate, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, I remember. His father went with me to Yeshiva yeah. from Italy, from Milano. 
Nice fellow, by the way. So imagine living in Utah. Okay, not in, 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 in Opaloka. In Utah. Yeah, and in the middle of nowhere. And then suddenly you find the Shamot. That's what Elkanah did. Elkanah says, I don't understand. We have access to Shiloh. We have the Mishkan with us. Let's go on a trip. Money is the issue. Matraf, I'll pay the ticket. Understand. What else do you need? What excuse do you have? Can you imagine that type of person? We can't. But this was this is a hut of Shia. Who had the tough job, Abraham Kimberlin or uh, The truth of the matter is dealing with Jews. that <laughs> correct, correct. That we're dealing in two separate chapters of yeah. history. Definitely, the times of Abraham Avino were very challenging. But also, when you deal with Yehudim, yeah. Moshe Rabbeinu can teach us a few <laughs> lessons on that topic. Yeah. That is not pashut. Four years, right? Am <laughs> kishe But nevertheless. Baruch Hashem, to a uh, we involved. Right? You know, Shlomo Melech says an interesting pasuk in the book of Mishle that goes as follows: Berovam hadrat Melech, with the multitude of the people is the beauty of the king. Okay, it's not the same thing when you pray in a minyan of eleven people, like if you pray in a minyan of twenty-five people, or a Shabbat. How beautiful it is when the Shabbat, the Hazanim sing and the Kahal follows. Or the Hazan sings and nobody sings because they don't know even how to read or how to sing a song. So he said, he said there is a difference and there is a benefit in the multitudes. And that's what the Kana achieved through his life. And we know the following. When a person does actions that benefit the tzibur, the public, there is heavenly compensation for that. Actually, in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, that says, "Kol auskim besibur en het kol mehit mehila en het arabim teluya bo." The Mishnah in Pirkei Avot writes that a person that occupies themselves with the tzibur, they get extra heavenly protection and zechuyot. Why? Because when you do something, it's not that I'm doing something to benefit one person. I'm doing something that I'm benefiting a hundred people. And guess what? The more people it benefits, the more the Beracha comes from Akadosh. So I think that we gave a nice introduction about El Kana. Let's move on now to Hana. We're dealing in a chapter of history that having multiple wives was permissible. Many years later, it came Rabbeinu Gershon Meora Gola, and he made it a takana that you're not allowed to be married more than one wife at the time. Now, although perhaps in certain Middle Eastern countries this was not really followed, but eventually has the modern days become activated and Eres Israel opened up and people made Aliyah to Israel. So even in those countries that perhaps a century or two ago, they used to have more than one wife, it doesn't apply to them. So there is no permission whatsoever to marry a second wife. Even Sam, Shidu, Sam Ketubot writes also that the husband is not allowed to marry a second wife unless the permission is given by the wife and by the bedin, perhaps due to the lack of, lack of child bearing, has the shalom. But don't try this at home, okay? Don't get ideas from what I'm saying. But I'm only giving you this type of brief introduction to understand why Elkanah had two wives. Even David Amele had more than one wife. But that's a different topic, not for today. Now, let's continue with Hannah. Penina, ten children. Hannah, zero children. Okay? Now, let's discuss. As I mentioned before, she was considered a Nevi'ah by the Gemara in uh, Megillah. Hannah, for many years, 
wasn't able to have children. Until one day, she turns, the Gemara in Berachot writes, she turns to Akadosh Baruch Hu, and she, I don't want to say the word complains to God, but she says to the Almighty, I don't understand. It is so difficult to grant me a child. So what Hashem answers, it says, you know what? I'll give you a child. That's what Shemuel Rabbah brings down. Now, if you look at Shemuel's prayer, but it says that if you look at uh, verse 13, let me see the chapter. There are nine times Hashem's name is mentioned. Hashem 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 Nine times. These nine times, it says here, interesting. Not only connected to the nine months of pregnancy, but actually to the nine berachot of the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah. It goes further and it says as follows The name Hannah, to all of us, it's a name. But Hannah is actually the abbreviation of the three misvot given to the wife. The Mishnah in Masechet Shabbat that we recite on Shabbat night says, "Al shalosh al shalosh averot nashim metod b'shaal litan al sheinan zehirot banida b'halla u'vadelakat aner." If you take these three misvot, halla het nida nun hadlaka he rashet evot hana. So she turns to Akadosh Baruch Hu. And she says, Olam, I am careful with this misvot. I want something back. So it goes further, and the Gemara brings another complaint, not complaint, comment, that she made to God. And Hannah turns to Akadosh Baruch Hu and she says, God, you created my human body, correct? You created the body male and female, each one obviously accordingly, for a specific purposes of life. One of the organs of reproduction, one of them is called the rehem, the womb of the wife, of the ladies. What's the purpose of the womb? To carry a child. So Hannah turns to God and it says, What's the purpose of my womb if I'm not able to get pregnant? Well, you created Heke, made in China. <laughs> you have a surplus of body parts and you give me a womb? I know it sounds funny, but it's a very valid claim. Check it out in the Gemara. And she prayed to Akadosh Baruch Hu that she wanted to have an average child. Now, what does it mean average? So I'll give you the description. Not tall or short. Not too thin, nor too heavy. Nor too dark skin or light skin. Nor too smart or too stupid. And Rashi asked, why? If you're really talking to God, give me the full package. He says, very simple. She wanted to protect her son from Ainara. To keep him average. Rather some women Ain, blessing is found on things that are hidden from the eyes. The less you talk about it, the better. The less you're flashy, the better. Goes further and it says. When she was able to conceive the Gemara in Berachot writes, the night of Rosh Hashanah, similar to Sarah Imeno, and when Rahel became pregnant with Yosef Hasadik. 
these three Sadiqim is Hakabino, Yosef Sadiq, and Shemuel Hanavi were conceived in the night of Rosh Hashanah. At the end of the day, if you look in the book of Shemuel, after the birth of Shemuel Hanavi, she had four more children. So all together, she had five. But here is the question. In Batit Palel Hanna, the Pasuk writes, listen to the Pasuk, Ad Akara Yaleda Shiva. She gave birth to seven. So hold on a minute. The Pasuk in Shemuel and Rashi says she gave birth to five children. So what do you mean that she had a seven children? So for that, we need to bring up a bittersweet chapter of the book of Shemuel. The Gemara tells us about Pedina, correct? The other wife of Elkanah. Now, you are the mother of ten children. The other wife has zero children. The Mephashim writes that Penina will tease Hannah. Leshem Shema, by the way, to push Hannah against the wall. Pray. Pray more. So imagine yourself that Penina gives Hannah a coupon to Toys R Us five dollars off in a box of diapers she has no babies she doesn't need diapers or she said you know what i have an extra stroller will you like to have it what do you think it went through the heart of hannah pain pain it's like you're telling a poor person your experience flying to Israel on a first class ticket. What are you doing it? You're rubbing it in the face. That's what Hannah did. Mehila. That's what Penina did. And the Gemara testifies. Penina Leshem Shamay The intentions of Penina were not to mock Hannah, but actually cause her the desire to have a child. So what happens? Hannah gives birth to Shemuel. Correct? At the same time, Penina buries two children. Hannah gives birth to child number two. Penina buries two more children. Hannah gives birth to child number three. Penina buries two more children. Hannah gives birth to child number four. Penina buries two more children. Now she is pregnant again. Penina says, Oli. What does Penina do? She takes her two children and gives them to Hannah to become the adoptive mother of these two children. And that's why the Pasuk says, she became the mother of seven, five biological and two adopted children from Penina. Goes further. And it says that if you remember the story with Aliyah Kohen, Aliyah Kohen was the Kohen Gadol of that time. And after Penina pushed Hannah to pray, she went to pray. She went to pray to the Mishkan, where the Luchot were, where Aliyah Kohen is. And you know the famous story that she will move her lips, but her words will not come out. By the way, Many of the alachot of the Amidah, we learned them from Hannah. That she turned her heart to Akadosh Baruch Hu, 
the lips were moving, but no sound was coming out. So if you remember the famous statement of Ali that tells her, stop drinking, what Ali thought that she was a drunken woman. Because she begged Ali, pray for me. You are the Sadiq of the world. Kohen Gadol. Pray for me. He prayed. And Shamayim answered Ali by shining four letters in the Hoshen Mishpat. We know the Hoshen Mishpat, the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol was utilized to ask specific questions. And the answer will come by the flashing of the letters. There were 72 letters, the name of the 12 tribes, Abraham, Ishaq, Yaakov, uh, Shiftei, Yeshurun. And the king needed, or the Kohen Gadol needed to decipher what was the answer. For example, if there was a war that they needed to activate against the enemy, no war was allowed until the, the, the Kohen Gadol got the answer. And one answer could be no answer. That means stay home. We're going to lose. If we go to war, we lose. Or, go out and you will become successful. So in the case of Ali and Hanab, there was four letters blinking. Chaf, Shin, Resh, He. What Ali said, Shikora, drunken. Shamayim did not approve. Keshera, Kesara, the lady in front of you is a Ksarai Menu. Pray for her. And we know the happy ending of the story. Ali blesses her. And Hannah makes a nether, a vow, a promise. What promise does she make? I'm donating my son to Hashem. What does that mean? You take the child. I donate my son to Hashem. We heard donating money, right? Sefer Torah raffles, things, physical things. A child, that's exactly what she did. She earmarked Shemuel owned by Hashem. And if you look in the book of Shemuel, that's exactly what happened. She took Shemuel with her. She gave birth to Shemuel. She nursed him until the age of two. When Shemuel turned two years old, she came to Ali. And she says, I'm the lady that you blessed over two or three years ago. I'm here to fulfill my commitment. I'm leaving my son with you. And Ali Cohen became the adoptive father of Shemuel Hanavi. And he was raised and educated by Ali Cohen. And he became eventually the great Shemuel Hanavi. But don't worry, Hannah will keep an eye on Shemuel. She will come to visit him often. She will bring him clothing because as the child was growing, he had needs, and obviously he needed a mother as well. But I'm telling you all this background information to understand who is this Elkanah and Hannah that merited to have a son like Shemuel and Nami. Now, there are more halakhot that we learn, but I think that for today we cover. Let's go very quickly to the life of Shemuel Hanavi. I don't believe that we're going to be able to take care of the Omer today, but Matchaf will take care of the Omer tomorrow as well, Beli Neder, but I think that it's important to understand a lot of the fascinating aspects of the life of Shemuel eh, Hanavi. So this was, I mentioned before, Shemuel born to Hannah and Elkanah, and he was eventually adopted by Shemuel, by Eli HaKohen. Now, 
when Shemuel was born, Elia Kohen was the Kohen Gadol for one year in human history. One year. Eventually, the Kohen uh, Gadol, Ali, remained alive till Shemuel was 30 some years old. So there were like 30 years of learning and training and mas uh, mentoring Shemuel. And eventually Shemuel becomes the first traveling Navi of the Jewish people. He will not stay at home. Shemuel Hanavi will travel from place to place to help the people, to settle dispute among people, and to give chizuk to Am Israel, wherever they will be. Now, the Shemot Rabbah brings an interesting connection between Moshe and Shemuel. And the Midrash Rabbah says as follows, God says, Moshe was a great leader that led my children for 40 years. But the way Moshe was, basically was, come see Moshe Rabbeinu in his office. Shemuel was completely the opposite. Where the people are, I'll go. So one week, he'll come to Aventura. Another week will be in Fort Lauderdale. Another week will be in Boca. Another week will be in Deal. Another week will be in Brooklyn. Another week will be in, in, in five towns. Every week, he will travel to see what were the needs, the spiritual needs of Am Israel. And therefore, God says, since Shemuel will be traveling, I will hold his hand. I will travel with him. One of the peculiar matters of behavior that Shemuel Hanavi had was that he never accepted any invitation or any food from anyone. He would travel with his food, he would travel with his tent, and he would not accept anything from anyone. Why not? Because let's say that you suddenly see Shemuel Hanavi in the synagogue and you say, Navi Shemuel, come home for dinner. I have a guest room in my home. But guess what? Tomorrow you had a court case with another Jew and Shemuel was going to be the judge. So automatically, because you were so kind to Shemuel, he couldn't deal with your case. So that's why Shemuel and Navi refused to accept any invitation from anyone, which that proven to be a problem for Shemuel and Navi, because eventually, because he prevented people of giving kavod to the Talmide Hachamim. And the Gemara writes, Gadol Shimusha Yoter Milimuda. It says, you can learn from a rabbi, the intellectual aspect, but if you spend time with a rabbi, and you hang around the rabbi, you will learn more things. That's what the Gemara writes. So Shemuel was rebuked for that. You did not give a chance to people to get to know you. They remember you as the Shemuel the prophet and Shemuel the judge. What about Shemuel the rabbi? What about Shemuel the influencer in a good way? Excuse me? That that Nida that, that he had could have done something to the east. They only kept the No. 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 We'll, hopefully we'll get there uh, eventually. So also Shemuel and Navi was the one actually Shemuel was a Nazi. A Nazarine. A Nazarene. Meaning to say that no wine no grape juice from birth. Also, Shemuel Hanavi was born circumcised with a Benit Mila. Not too many Sadikim had this particular uh, merit. The Gemara in Berachot writes 
also compared to Moshe and Aharon, he was also called Ro'e, the shepherd of Am Israel. He's actually the one who wrote the majority of the book of Shemuel, and Sefer Shobetim, and Megillat Ruth. So concerning Shemuel, Shemuel had a different, a difficult mission throughout his lifetime. First, appointing Shaul as the king of Israel something that he wasn't happy with. Why? Because Shaul considered that this request from the Jewish people to ask the prophet, we want a king like the rest of the nations have. And Shemuel was upset. You are not the rest of the nation. We have a Shem. Melech Malchea Menachim. So eventually, Shaul, uh, Shemuel appoints Shaul HaMelech, the first king of Israel. But we know the unfortunate time in the kingdom of Shaul that he fails to get rid of the king of Amalek. God sends a message to Shaul, to Shemuel, Mehila, and it says, you know what? I need a new leader. I reject the kingdom of Shaul. Even though Shaul was a holy man, Shaul wasn't a simple person. Shaul was, besides the tallest man in Israel, Shaul was, the Pasuk writes, Ben Shana Shaul Lemolcho. Shaul was one year old when he becomes the king of Israel. I ask you a question. Does it make sense what I'm saying? That he was Ben Shana Shaul Lemolcho, the Mefarshim say, like a one year old baby has no Averot, Shaul has zero Averot. But when it came to the war against Amalek, Shaul hesitated and God utilized very harsh languages about Shaul. In plain English, he says, no more. Give me a new king. But stand the shway. What do you think? Get a new king. You go to Amazon and you say, I'm searching for a king. Not only that, if you look for a king while the king is alive and he becomes aware of that, he has the power to execute you. Because you're committing treason against the kingdom. So in Jewish history, how does one becomes a king by the death of the previous king. No elections, like in Colombia today, right? No elections. The king is appointed, Hazak Baruch. So now, Shemuel is in a very difficult position. And we know the end of the story. He goes to the house of Ishai, the son of Mehila, the, the father of King David, and he tells Ishai in a quiet way, bring all your children. They made a Se'udah Mizvah. And the purpose of this gathering was, since God told Shemuel, go to Ishai in Bethlehem and select one of his sons to be the next king of Israel. So Shemuel in his mind thinks, what's so difficult? I look at the boys, I pick the, way, the best that's good in my eyes. This is the comment of Shemuel. Ishai parades his children. The first one, Eliab, I believe his name was, Eliab, Eliab. Shemuel says, tall, strong, Talmid Hakan, a warrior, great fit for a king. God says, Mahila, out. <coughs> what? Anger. Short fuse. If you're a king and the life of people is in your hands, 
if you are not calm and collected, but you have a short fuse and you explode for no reason, you are a dangerous leader. Out. That says out. Second one. Also, that says out. Why? Arrogance, ga'ava. Each son that Shemuel thought that will be a candidate, God says to him to power of prophecy, disqualify, 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 disqualify. He tells Ishai, Shemuel tells Ishai, this is it. This is it. God told me a message. And everyone, the one that is here, is telling me, no, you're hiding something from me. And Ishai says, yes, I have one more son, but he's good for nothing. He's a shepherd. He's a shepherd. I'm not sure that he said good for nothing, God forbid. But you have to understand, they cast him out of the house. Go play with the, the harp. Go play with the flute. Go sing your songs and take care of the animals. That's your mission. A shepherd. A shepherd. But a shepherd, Moshe Rabbeinu, was also called, called a shepherd. David Amelech was also was called a shepherd. Shemuel and Abim was also was called a shepherd. Although to the outside world, being a shepherd is a simple, lowly type of thing to do, but from a Kabbalistic perspective, a shepherd is something very holy and very special. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu was called Ra'ya Mehenna. In Shavuot, we sing a song. That song, what well, others are it? Ro'ene Eman, faithful shepherd. Let's continue. Finally, Shemuel sees David. What is the reaction of Shemuel when he sees David? He says, Uli. This one looks more like a son. That's what he wrote. The Pasuk says. David was red-headed. He wasn't the tallest fellow. He was average. And Shemuel doesn't know if this is what God intended. God sends a wake-up call to Shemuel and it says, you know what the problem here is? Ki ha'adam ro'e la'inayim. Ve Hashem ro'e la'levav. Translation. You are judging the book by its cover. You saw the first son, tall, handsome, religious, powerful, elegant. You thought that this is the full package. But you don't see his heart. But I see the heart. Even though in your eyes, David is not suitable, I'm telling you, this is the one. And eventually, Shemuel accepts David's kingdom. And obviously, Shemuel realized the greatness of David. But you have to remember one thing. She Shaul still alive. So imagine yourself, a person is dating before divorcing. Make sense? So how do you handle that? You have a newly appointed king and you have an existing king. So obviously everything needed to be kept on the cover. But also parallel to that, Shaul HaMelech starts to develop depression, sadness. Because once Shemuel tells him, you're no longer welcome in the eyes of God. Yeah, and we're going to keep you here till the day you leave the world. Can you imagine being in, in Shaul's shoes? He's telling you God doesn't like you. Can you let these words sink in your mind? God is disappointed at you. I don't even know what else to say. But if you look in the book of Shemuel, 
I'm using my language. Ki maos mimasti. Maos, mius, is something disgusting. I'm fed up with you. So you know that if God is fed up with you, you have a, low, a short lifespan. You have a short lifespan. This is it. We already have the backup plan. We're just waiting for you to leave the world to activate the new key. I'm sorry if it sounds dramatic, but this is exactly what happens. Now, Shemuel has an issue. Shemuel says, I'm the Navi of Israel. Now I'm going to answer the question why Shemuel requested to be taken away from the world prematurely. Shemuel makes the following calculation. Shemuel says, I am the Navi of Israel. I'm the prophet. There is no one greater than Shemuel in his time. This is the reality. And it doesn't sound arrogant, but this is the reality of Shemuel. He was the Sadiq of the generation. Now, for God's plans to become activated about the kingdom of David, which is the beginning of the Davidic dynasty, Shaul needs to leave the world. So if Shaul leaves the world during my lifetime, people may say, what kind of prophet were you? Couldn't you see that he will live only two years as a king? For that, you gave us a king that's going to be for two years? So Shemuel believed, rightfully so, that Shaul leaving the world by natural means would have created the desecration of Hashem's name. So what did Shemuel do? Shemuel turns to God and he says, Hashem, do me a favor, take me back. And lo and behold, the Pasuk says, by he kizakan Shemuel. Shemuel became old overnight. And a short time later, passed away. So now, the picture makes sense. When people saw Shemuel, that he was very old, when Shemuel passed away, they attributed the passing of Shemuel due to aging. He was an old guy. Remember him, white beard, white hair, you know, how long? He was adopted as a young child. They didn't keep records that like we have records of when he was born, social security, none of this existed. So, Shemuel passes away. Then eventually, Shaul goes to war. And Shaul dies in the war. So now no one can say anything. Shaul died as a hero. Shemuel died before as an old man. And now the new king of Israel becomes David Amen. That he became the king of Israel for 40 years. Years. David Amena became the king of Israel at the age of 30 and passed away at the age of 70. Now, there is one more thing to say. Remember in the night of Pesach, the Gemara or the, the, the Haggadah brings a very interesting statement from Rabbi al Azar bin Azaria. Amar Rabbi al Azar bin Azaria, Hariani Kevin Shivim Shana. I am like eight, 70 years old. Rabbi Ali explains that what difference does it make how old was Rabbi al Azar bin Azaria? And he says, I am like 70. So Rabbi Ali explains. If you look at the word Ben Keben, is 52. And Shivain is 70. 70 minus 52, how much is it? 
18. So that time, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah was 18 years old. But he was the Gilgul of Shemuel and Navi. He was the reincarnation of the soul of Shemuel. The background of the story was that Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah was appointed to be the Rosh Yeshiva on that time of Talmudic learning. But he was a very young man. He did not have any facial hair. He did not have any beard. And overnight, 18 strands of beard, white hair, grew in his face. And that's when he says, I am like 70 years old, 52 from Shemuel, plus 18 of my life, 7. And then we know the rest of the story. This is in a nutshell, was the background of Hannah, Elkanah, Penina, Shemuel, David, everything fits and everything matches. Accordingly, Zechutami again Aleno, may the marriage shield us, and we'll have Ezat Hashem, the Geulah Shelema, Bimera Beyameno, Amen. Rabbucha Adonai Le'Aulam, Amen Be'Amen. Rabbi Hananiah Ben Akashia Omer, Ratsa HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot Et Yisrael. Lefichach, Kirba Lahen Torah Mizbot Sheneimar, Adonai Hafez, Lema'an Sitko, Yagdil.